going to start start that up and okay well this evening um i want to get right away to the next step and then if we have time at the end we'll practice uh, another diagram from colossians uh, together but I want to make sure to get through this next step because it's uh, also helpful in our process of studying. Um, the first three steps, as we have said, focus our attention on the book as a whole and studying the book overall. Then in the fourth step, we move our attention to the passage itself. And the key uh, step <clears throat> in looking at the passage is the diagram as we have spent time doing. Once you've completed the diagram, <clears throat> the next step is to, to look at, <clears throat> excuse me, to look at the, the diagram and make what I call textual observations of the passage. Uh, that's a little different than the <clears throat> first step to read and observe the book. Uh, the first step focuses on the book as a whole and looks for the just general observations or observations related to uh, to the book. This step five actually is to then uh, look at the passage you have diagrammed and identify certain um, grammatical or even semantic features within the passage. This is a another a deeper, more specific type of observing. And it's to look for very specific things. And last week when we met, uh, we turned our attention to the key part of <clears throat> uh, a passage, and that are the verbs. And if you remember, there were three characteristics uh, of the verb that we talked about. And one being the tense, the second being the mood, and then the third being what was called the voice. All right, now in English, the tense, there are three primary tenses. There's a couple of other ones, but the primary tenses are past, present, and future. All right, English is driven very significantly by time, uh, verbs and actions in relation to time. There's a second element, a more difficult one, and it's called the mood of the verb. And we looked at four moods. There are a couple of others as well, but I focused our attention on four moods of the verb, which are the indicative, which makes a statement, the imperative, which is a command or instruction, the interrogative, which is a question, and then what's called the subjunctive, which introduces a degree of uncertainty for the action. So let me just show you a couple of examples here to review and remind us of that, okay? So when we're looking at verbs in our passage, we're looking for uh, what kind of mood is the verb. Now I have, the, again, there's the verb of action as we've discussed and the verb of being. So the indicative mood for a verb of action would be, an example would be, I hit the ball. That's it, making a statement, a declaration. Now the imperative mood would be a command, hit the ball. It's an instruction, it's a, a directed command to do something. The interrogative mood would be in the form of a question. We don't know if the person hit the ball or not, so we say, did you hit the ball? And then finally, the subjunctive mood, which presents a degree of uncertainty to the action. So here it is, I might hit the ball. Uh, we don't, or I may hit the ball. That, that word might tells us there's some uncertainty. So these are the four kinds of moods that we'll look at. Now, a verb of being, which again is a, a state or condition of the subject. The verb of action is the subject doing something. A verb of being would be uh, indicative, would be I'm happy. That's just making a statement. Uh, it's stating a fact or, or a condition in this case. The imperative would be, be happy. You're, you're being commanded to be a particular state. Question would be, are you happy? That's the interrogative. And then finally, the subjunctive for this example would be something like, I may be happy. I, I might be happy. Uh, even I should be happy. Okay? So these are the four moods <clears throat> uh, 
uh, that are presented. Um, again, we're looking at in English. Now, these moods exist in Greek as well. There's an additional mood called the, the optative. And this is just for fun. Uh, we don't have an optative in English, but it, the optative mood in Greek is very rare. So for example, out of the, oh, what is it? Um, how many thou, I don't remember if it's 20 some 28,000 verbs in the Greek text. Um, 75 of them are in the optative mood. Okay, so it's pretty rare in Greek, but the optative mood is the idea of I might perhaps maybe hit the ball. Okay, it's, it's the mood of extreme doubt, of extreme uncertainty. Um, it's called the optative mood. There's a few examples in, uh, in um, scripture. Uh, for example, uh, let me show you one. Just, I think this is just helpful for you to know. Uh, as I said, the other, there are other mood, the other moods are in Greek as well. There's an indicative mood in Greek. It's the same thing. It's a statement of fact. There's an imperative mood in Greek, um, as well as Hebrew, which is a command. There's the interrogative mood in Greek, the, a question, and then subjunctive is also in Greek. Uh, I might hit the ball. Now, there's also this optative mood. Um, let's see, Acts, I think 17, if I remember right. Um, yes. Let me have... Uh, Ask Norman. Norman, would you uh, read verses 24 to, to 28, Acts chapter 17? If Can you see here okay? Yes, I'm fine. Thank you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all people life and death and and all things and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live all to live on all the face of the earth having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation that they would seek god if perhaps they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us for in him we live and move and exist as even some of your own poets have said for we also are his children all right thank you of course this is when the apostle paul was uh preaching to the athenians they uh took him up he was in athens uh, preaching the gospel and there was a a group of them that were skeptical wanted him to explain and answer uh, what what is this teaching he was giving so he was brought up to mars hill which is actually just a a rock just below uh, the parthenon i i was able to visit it a couple of years ago um, and stand on mars hill where paul was and he stood before this council and essentially spoke of <clears throat> that gave them the gospel and uh, yes, he gave this statement. He describes to them they had a statue, right, to an unknown god. They had many gods throughout the city, and Paul noticed this, and he noticed the statue given to the unknown god. So he said, "This is the true god that you need to worship." <clears throat> he makes an interesting statement in here. He declares who God is, and then notice verse twenty-six. He says that God made every nation to live on all the face of the earth having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. So God is sovereign over uh, when we are born, where we are born, um, and even as a nation. And then notice he says this, that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him. Now, this word uh, grope is just an idea of, of seeking, but it's in the optative mood. And notice in English, that's presented with if perhaps they might grope for him. 
So really what Paul is saying here is that uh, men don't seek God. It's, it's very, very, very unlikely that anyone would seek God or grope for him. And so he's making us, it's important that you understand the mood here of this verb grope, that it is an optative verb, which means that it's very, 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 very doubtful, highly unlikely. Okay, and so that tells us that really, theologically, it is God who seeks the sinner, and rather than the sinner on his own seeking God. Remember, Ephesians 2 says we are dead in sin, and we cannot make ourselves alive. And so here is one example in Acts 17 of this optative uh, verb. Uh, now, <clears throat> How would you know that? Well, in English, there's a couple of clues with the word perhaps and then added to the word might that adds a degree of doubt to it. Uh, later, I'll be showing you use it to, how to use a, what's called an interlinear, and you can be able to identify these uh, the mood of the verb as well. But I just wanted to show you one example of this verb that is in the optative mood. Now, again, in English, we don't have that um sorry let me get back on the right here we go in english we already don't have an optative mood you would just express it by using you know the uh, several of these helping verbs that have the idea of doubt so our focus is going to be on these first four moods that's what we're going to see uh, primarily as we study and that, so that's what you want to look for at these verbs and then finally, there's tense, there's mood, and then voice. Okay, voice really has to do with, it's the nature of the verb in relation to the subject. That is, what, what is the action taking place in relation to the subject? So, for example, the active voice is the subject performing the action. So, I hit the ball. That's active. The subject's doing the action. Now, a passive voice would be the action is being done to the subject. So in this case, the ball is the subject was hit. So the action is being done to the subject. That is the passive voice. And then finally, as I mentioned to you, Greek has a middle voice that is the actions being done by the subject for the benefit of the subject or towards the subject. So I hit myself the ball. In this case, hit would be in the middle voice because the action is being done by the subject for the benefit of the subject. All right. Now, in English, we don't have a middle voice. Uh, we add these personal pronouns to indicate this idea of, of something being done for the benefit or towards or for the subject. All right. So this is like a verb of action. A verb of being uh, would be, I am happy. That's active. I was made happy. So that's passive. Uh, something else uh, made the subject happy. And then the middle voice would be, I made myself happy. All right. So these are the three things you're going to look for when you look for the, at the verbs, the tense, the mood, and the voice. Understanding that will be very helpful. You need to know, is this a verb of, is this indicative or is this an imperative? Right? If God's speaking and he gives an imperative, we should know this is a command. God's telling us to do something. So we need to make sure we understand uh, the difference between them. And then the voice and the tense are also very important. And last week, we looked at the verb be filled uh, with the spirit we talked about that and we found that this verb was present tense active or uh, sorry um imperative mood and it was passive so it was a command to do in the present but it was a command to have something done to us that is the spirit filling us so you can go back to the notes and discussion last week to review that all right, but I just wanted to quickly review the verbs. Are there any questions on the verbs before we go to the next 
topic here. All right, so, so after the, after you do the diagram, the first thing you want to do, look at then is go through the passage and look at the verbs in each verse and just identify the tense, the mood, and the voice, all right? Now, the second thing you want to look for are the pronouns. <clears throat> uh, pronouns can be very important and very helpful to identify. And in a pronoun, remember, is, is any word that's used in place of a noun, okay? It functions like a noun, <clears throat> and it points to a noun. <clears throat> Boy, sorry about that. My throat is... I have a problem today. <clears throat> okay, so pronouns would be something like, right, I or we, they, us, them, me. Okay, these are all pronouns that reference or refer to another word in the sentence and are used in place of them. Now, what we want to do is look for the pronouns and identify what does that pronoun refer to, okay? So, for example, in this passage, Ephesians 1, <clears throat> um, let me ask uh, Pastor Philip, can you identify the, the pronouns in this passage? Go ahead and read it, and then after that, identify the, the pronouns, okay? <clears throat> sure. Thank you. Sorry. Can you hear me okay? Pastor Philip, you're muted. Can you uh, can you read the text and then identify the pronouns in this passage? Sure. The Thank blessed you. be the God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace okay there's a lot of pronouns in here can you uh identify them mm -hmm. for us maybe start in verse three do mm -hmm. we see the pronouns there yeah. so now are the Lord Jesus Christ, the God, the God, oh, so now, yeah, our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. Us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, and just as he chose us again in verse four. Us. Okay, let's stop at verse three for a minute. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us. Okay, who are those, who do those pronouns refer to in verse three? So, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord. That is God the Father. Okay, so the pronoun our, uh, who does that refer to? Does that refer to God the Father? Amen. Sorry? I think our refers to the Philippians believers. Yeah, the, the Ephesians in this case, that's who. Uh, yeah. And... Paul, right? The author and the recipients? 
Yes. And then the same for for us, right? When he says us, yeah. same thing. All right, now there's another pronoun here in verse three, who? All right, that's a relative pronoun. And no. who no. does that refer to? I think this who refers to Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, there's two options, right? right? It's it's uh, Jesus yeah. Christ, or it could be the Father, right? Father, yes. Now notice it says, "Who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ?" So actually, that tells us what does it is it the Father who blessed or the Lord Jesus who blessed? In this passage, in that case, the Father. Yes, the Father. It's the Father because it. Because it says he blessed us in Christ. So he's not saying that Jesus, that Christ blessed us in Christ, but that the Father blessed us in Christ. All right? Yeah. So who refers to the Father? All right, now, verse 4. Can you identify the pronouns there? Us. Okay, there's us again. And in him. Yeah, him. And then we, that we. Him again here. Him. Okay, and there's one more in verse four. For he. Yes. He. He. Just now. Okay, so us and we, we know that refers to Ephesians uh, and Paul. author recipients, okay, just as it did. What about he? Who does that refer to in verse four? Just as he chose us. He refers to the Father. Yeah, how do you know it's not? referring to christ because just as he chose us in him this him refers to christ yes that so <clears throat> this is this passage there's two uh, there's the father and the son being spoken of here and it's a little bit confusing because the same pronouns are used, he and him, and one of them, the he, refers to the father because the him refers to the son. So this passage, uh, why am I having you guys look for the pronouns? Because if we don't, you could get the meaning of the text wrong if you get these pronouns mixed up, okay? Um. So, for example, he, the Father, chose us in him, the Son, before the foundation of the world, that we, author and recipients, be holy and blameless before him. Now, who do you think this him refers to? I think this one is the Father. Yes. So, the first him... <laughs> I'll do the, the first hymn refers to the son, to Christ. I'll just follow the, the second hymn in verse four is the father. Okay. Cause he's the one doing the action. And so he, the father chose us in Christ so that we would be holy and blameless before the father. Okay. Now this keeps going. We'll just do uh, we'll do one more verse, and then I think because I think you get the idea. Do verse five if if you would please. Yes, uh, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself 
according to the kind intention of his will. So here, uh, he, the pronoun he, and then another pronoun is us. And we can see here uh, himself. It's a reflective pronoun, or I don't know. Yeah, himself. And possessive pronoun his. All right. So again, I think the easy one is us, right? That's the Ephesians and Paul. And by the way, why is that important? Well, what is Paul saying about himself and the Ephesians? That he's God chose us, that he predestined us, right? He's saying that, that these Ephesians are believers, all right? That's important when we look at other things in the letter to recognize Paul refers to his recipients as believers, all right? So keep that in mind. So when... Because some letters, like in Hebrews, um, it's addressed to those who are claiming to be believers. All right? But in this letter, Paul's addressing those who are believers. He's writing to Christians. All right? that, that's important mm -hmm. to, to recognize. And so seeing these pronouns and understanding who the pronouns refer to is important. Now, again, we're asking the question, okay, what about... He, who is the he in verse five? He predestined us. He, it refers the father. And how do we know that? Because he predestined us to Jesus Christ. Yes. As All right. Through Jesus Christ. So again, the father is doing the action because it mentions the son. He's doing the action through the Son. He predestined us through Jesus Christ now to himself. Means the that Father, right? himself, the Father. Yes. Again, because he predestined us through Christ to himself. And then according to the kind intention of his will. Whose will? will. The Father's will. Yes. Again, because... Christ is mentioned as, as uh, separately in this particular sentence. All right, so this passage, um, again, verse 6, it's the same thing. His grace, that's the Father's grace, which he, the Father, freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. So we know that his and he, in verse 6, refer to the Father because, again, it says, in the Beloved, that is the Son. All right, in him, now here, notice, in him we have redemption through his blood. Okay, who does that refer to in verse 7? We have him and his blood. Is that the father or the son? I think it refers to the son. Yes, because the father didn't shed his blood, the son did. Okay, mm. so... Here in this passage, it's a, a little bit tricky because the same pronoun is used, he and him, himself, his, but it could refer possibly to the father or to the son. You have to look at very carefully to identify that because if we were to say um, that his blood is the father's blood, then we would be uh, committing an error in this case. So here, Paul is being precise as far as to whom he refers, and we have to pay attention to that. Some passages, the pronouns are critical to understand what it refers to, all right? So you have to be very carefully observing the text to, to note that, all right? And I think this passage is just one example which shows the importance of identifying the pronouns, but specifically identify who do each does each pronoun refer to. Okay. Any questions on this? 
So how about according to the riches of his grace? That means the Father's grace, right? Yeah, I think so, because verse, seven. Yeah. verse six, it says, to the praise of the glory of his grace. And I think here, yeah, it's referring again to the Father. Now, of course, we're speaking of the Trinity here. And so the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are of the same essence. But remember, there are three distinct persons. And here, Paul is identifying the role of each member of the Trinity in our salvation. And here we see there is a different role between each of them in respect to our salvation. It was not the Father who went to the cross, right? The Son went to the cross. Okay, so technically speaking, Paul says the Father predestined us through the Son. Um, and in verse 7, in him, that is the Son, we have redemption through the Son's blood. Okay, it's not the Father's blood or the Spirit's blood. It is the Son's blood because only the Son of God became man. Hmm. So theologically, we have to understand this. This passage is extremely profound in describing the role of the Father in our salvation. That uh, If we go back to verse 4, He chose us, that is the Father chose us in the Son, that we would be holy and blameless before the Father. Verse 5, the Father predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. Again, according to the mm -hmm. kind intention of his will. So that we see here, in regards to our salvation, it is the Father who chose, the Son who redeemed. And then we will, later uh, in verse 12, it says the Spirit sealed us. All right. So in this passage, it is important that we understand because there are three members of the Trinity who are all persons and who all are referred to as he. Um, we have to be careful to understand which he the pronoun is referring to. And that takes some careful uh, thought and observation as you look at the details in the passage. Any questions about the pronouns or about this particular passage? Okay, thank you, Pastor Philip. That there were some uh, challenges there okay. trying to figure that out, but that was a good job. All right, so so we look for uh, when we do the textual observations, we look for the verbs. We look at, uh, so the verbs and identify the tense, the mood, and the voice. Then we look at the pronouns and identify who, who does the pronoun refer to. And that is called uh, in English, the antecedent. The antecedent is the, what, who the pronoun refers to. So for example, in this last verse, verse seven, in him, the antecedent is the beloved. All right, that's what him refers to specifically here, grammatically. The, the previous, uh, usually the antecedent refers to the, the closest uh, antecedent to it. In this case, it is the beloved, which is a reference to Christ. Okay, and through his blood. But then, uh, according to the riches of his grace, um, I believe that goes back to the Father because it's describing his grace, which he mentions in verse 6, which is in reference to the Father. Because it says he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. So the his grace in verse 6, that his is the same as he, which we know is the Father because he bestowed on us in the Son. All right. <laughs> Are you confused yet? <laughs> so... Um, so again, it takes careful observation to determine in this passage in particular, this is one of the more difficult ones. Uh, that's why I chose it because it's, I wanted to show you the importance of identifying these pronouns. So identify the verb and the pronouns, 
And then the third thing we're going to look for is the conjunctions. Now, we've spent a lot of time on these guys. Um, so I'm not going to spend much time here. But it's helpful to, after you've done the diagram, go back and look for the particular conjunctions in the passage and identify, remember, there are two kinds, the coordinating conjunctions. Um, again, that's and boy, if you remember, and nor, but, or, yet. And those coordinating conjunctions connect two ideas that are grammatically equal. All right? They're grammatically equal. Subordinating conjunctions connect two ideas which are unequal. That is, uh, the subordinating conjunction introduces a clause that comes under or modifies another word in the sentence. Okay, and again, you can go back to uh, our last unit, um, I forget the early sessions, and we, we spent, I spent a lot of time going through this with you. It's helpful now in this step, after you've done the diagram, to go back and identify those conjunctions. So, for example, I already did that here for you in Romans chapter, uh, Romans chapter 12, where we have uh, the, I've highlighted the conjunctions. The yellow highlight is the subordinating conjunctions. The green highlight is the coordinating conjunctions. Okay? So, for example, in this passage, therefore is a subordinate, subordinating conjunction. And what it's doing is it's connecting Romans 12, 1 through 3, or 1 through following to Romans chapter 1 through 11. It's, it's giving now, um, Romans 12 through 16 is the response to what Paul said in Romans 1 through 11. So this therefore is a very big therefore in the letter because it is transitioning from what Paul has been saying about the gospel in Romans 1 through 11. And then he says, therefore, in response to what I have just said about the gospel in the last 11 chapters, therefore, I urge you to respond in this way. Okay? And we know that he's saying that because notice he says the mercies of God. The mercies of God is what he's been describing in Romans 1 through 11. All right, so he's saying, therefore, I urge you by what I've been saying to you about the gospel and the mercies of God in the last 11 chapters, therefore, I urge you to, and then he gives the instruction, chapters 12 to 16, okay? So this, therefore, is a big, important word in this letter, and it connects, uh, connects Romans 12, uh, 1, really, th Romans 12 through 16 to Romans 1 through 11. All right? That is Romans 12 to 16 is the response Paul urges based on Romans 1 through 11. Because we know that because of the nature of the subordinating conjunction. It subordinates, it, it brings under what follows it to what came before it. All right? So Paul says, therefore, and then he says, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. So the and here is connecting uh, live, living and sacrifice. Uh, sorry. I'm, I'm wrong. Living and holy sacrifice. So it's connecting those two adjectives here in the sentence that describe sacrifice. So again, remember, coordinating conjunctions connect two grammatically equal ideas. So in this case, in verse 1, they're connecting two adjectives. All right? In verse 2, so if I were to show that, Here, um, how would I do that? So he's connecting uh, a 
living and holy sacrifice. All right. Those are being connected together. They both describe sacrifice, a kind of sacrifice. Now, verse 2, that conjunction and is connecting two independent clauses. I urge you to present your bodies and do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we've got in verse 2, those coordinating conjunctions are connecting two independent clauses. Okay, so uh, so for example, is I urge you to present your bodies and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. All right, so those coordinating conjunctions are connecting these three independent clauses. Okay, so this is the process that you need to just go through is identify those conjunctions, which you do when you do the block diagram, but then it's good to uh, confirm how they are functioning in the sentence. All right. And again, there's still two kinds, the coordinating ones and the subordinating ones. And then uh, I just gave you this passage for an example. All right. Questions on that? Hopefully, that's review. Um, I know it's been a while since we talked about these, but uh, again, you can go back in your notes in the early sessions of uh, Unit 2 to review that if, if you can't remember. Okay. So we look for verbs, we look for pronouns, we look for conjunctions. The fourth thing you want to look for is, is there any words that are being repeated? Um, any words that are... Uh, being repeated through the through the particular passage all right so for example um here let me just i'll ask uh, paul paul if you could read this passage for us let me pull it up and then uh, identify there we go all right paul's can you read this and then I, let's identify what words we see repeated here, including synonyms. Second Corinthians 1, 3 to 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same suffering which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. Okay. Paul, did you catch any words that are repeated here? <laughs> uh, God is repeated at least uh, three times. Um, okay. Yeah, we have God. Father comforted by Father God. Is yeah, Father is repeated twice. Um, I mean, just, yeah. But I think we want to get to the comfort, right, which is repeated so many times there, so. Yeah, obviously your comfort. Whoops. Yeah, how many times do we see that here? Um, <laughs> God of all before, comfort, yeah, comfort. who comforts yeah. us so that we may be able to comfort others with the comfort which we are comforted by. So also our comfort. <laughs> Verse 6, comfort. Verse six, comforted, comfort. 
I think it's 10 times here. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. 10 times in five verses. Right. What do you think Paul's emphasizing here in this passage? <laughs> What's the focus? Yeah. Uh, don't say something about comfort in the in your sermon. You're missing yeah. out big time. Yeah. If you don't mention <laughs> comfort in your sermon, you've missed it. <laughs> but there's another. So you'd want it definitely uh, in our in the next step. By the way, it's word studies. Comfort would definitely be a word you would want to study in this passage, right? Because clearly Paul is uh, focusing attention on it. But there's actually another word that's also repeated. Yeah. Affliction and sufferings, I think both similar words. So yes, that's so, so, uh, yeah. Affliction, um, affliction, sufferings, afflicted, sufferings, um, sufferings, suffer. You guys see that? Uh, so, yeah, they're synonyms here, but they refer to the same idea, the afflictions, affliction and suffering. Uh, we see that those words used seven times here. So just by looking at the repetition, what would you say is the theme of this passage or the focus here? Maybe Paul, why don't... What do you think? <laughs> comfort, comfort in the in sufferings and afflictions. Yeah. Yes, that's the theme. Now, here he's saying that because we've received comfort in our sufferings, then we can be a source of comfort to others in their sufferings. All right, that's the basic idea. But notice, this is a abundant emphasis on those two ideas comfort and suffering all right so here's a an example there's a few other words repeated uh, you noted god uh, father referenced a few times christ is repeated here um i think three times that i can see in these verses so there are a few other things, but the obvious one, the most, the dominant repetition here is that. Now, again, look for not just the same word. Obviously, you're going to look for variations of that word. Notice we have comfort, singular, comforts, plural, comforted. That's a verb form. Um, uh, so, but they're all the same root word and then affliction and suffering those are two different words but they're synonyms they're strongly linked together so when you look for repetition don't just look for the exact same word but look for basically the family of words that are related to that same idea all right any questions here from, from this one Again, this is a step of observation. You're just looking for a particular things. And so we've talked about, you look for verbs and you identify specific things about the verbs. You look for pronouns and identify who the pronouns refer to. Conjunctions, what kind of conjunctions, subordinate or coordinating. And then fourthly, look for repetition. All right, now the fifth thing the fifth thing to look for is what are like, are there any contrasts in the passage? Do we see anything in the in the text of that's being contrasted with something else? Uh, for example, here in uh, Ephesians five, maybe if I can have um, uh, Zali, could you read this one for us? Ephesians five. Sure. Thank you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 
and do not get drunk with wine for that that is dissipation but be filled with the spirit okay do you see any contrasts here things being contrasted unwise and wise good unwise don't walk as unwise but as wise okay good so you see any others another bath after foolish yes what's he contrasting here uh, did not foolish and the will of the lord yes don't be foolish but understand uh, the will of the lord all right so that's another contrast here now both of these contrasts are given in the form of a command. Don't do this, do this, all right? Uh, there's one more contrast in this passage. Do not get drunk with wine. But be filled with the spirit. There we go. And we talked about that last week. So there's an third contrast is don't get drunk with wine don't don't put yourself under the control of a substance but put yourself in the position to be controlled by the holy spirit all right so these are three contrasts mentioned here in this passage all right good so Again, that's just something, <clears throat> okay, you've gone through the text. First, you look for the verbs, go through the text, identify the verbs and their characteristics. Then you go through the passage again, looking for the pronouns, identifying their antecedents. Then go through the passage again, look for the uh, conjunctions. Go through it again, look for the, uh, what we just covered, the repetition, and then look through it again, look for contrast. Now, by going through this process, and you're going through this passage over and over again, looking for specific things, what do you think will happen as a result of that? Do you think you'll become more familiar with the passage? Do you think that things might come out that you hadn't seen before? I, I think so. That, that's the purpose for this step, is to really continue to to look for things and as you do you'll notice things that you hadn't seen before so the the intent of this step is not just to create work to do <laughs> it's not like okay i'm going to keep you busy with assignments so let me see what can i come up with to keep these guys busy doing things that's not the purpose here the purpose is to give you specific uh, steps so that, that will help you to see things within the passage. And so here, I'm having you look for specific things. These are all uh, grammatic, grammatical or, or semantic, that is, that helps us uh, see the meaning. I'm giving you specific things to look for because I have found that as you do this, as you make these observations, you will see things in the text. Remember um, in the last step, the diagram step, that uh, sometimes there may be a phrase or a clause and you think this could go with this word or it could go with this other word, right? We had that happen where you're not sure which it goes to. And I said, well, Keep going in the process, and eventually you will get more ideas of how to identify what word it modifies. 
Well, this step of textual observation will help you with that. As you go through this, you'll, you'll begin to understand the passage more and it will answer some of those questions you may have had from your block diagram. Just by getting more and more familiar with this passage and looking for particular features within it. So that's the, the importance of this step and why I'm having you do it, okay? So after you identify the contrast within the passage, and there may not be some, sometimes a passage won't have any contrasts, all right? But um, in this passage I chose you did, then look for comparisons, okay? Is there any, any word or, or phrase or idea that's being compared to or that you notice um, mentioned that is comparing one thing or person or idea with something else, all right? Um, look for similarities, things that are similar to one another. So here's a passage also in Ephesians that identifies a very important comparison. Uh, let's see, who has not read? Uh, Fu Wei, can you read this passage for us and identify the comparisons? Okay. Okay, uh, Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind to one another, tender hearts, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitated of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you, and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, for the similar theme. Yeah, what, what's being compared here? Or who is being compared, I should say. Okay, uh, so. Yeah, I think it's the, this side, this, uh, us, uh, we are being compared with God in Christ. Yeah, how, where do we see that? Uh, so the first one will be, be kind to one another, tender heart, forgiving each other. Yeah. So the words that connect is just as God yes. in Christ has forgiven us, forgiven you. Yeah, the comparison is, we're being told to be uh, like God. We're being compared to God. He's saying, be kind, tenderhearted, forgive, just as God has forgiven you. So that forgiving each other, if I could highlight, forgiving each other, just as God has forgiven you. That's the comparison here in verse 32. And in this case, the comparison's being given as something to pursue. We should be like God in this way. All right, just as he forgave, so we should forgive. So that's one example. Is there, do you see any other comparisons in this passage? Yeah, there's one more, isn't there? Uh, Fu Wei, where, where is it? Okay. Uh, what in love, just as Christ also love you. Yeah, walk and in get love. Himself Good. Just as. There's that. In this case, the comparison is uh, given by those two words, just as. So here in verse 2, walk in love just as Christ loved you. So again, we're given a comparison that we are to do something in comparison to or from the example of in this case, Jesus Christ, all right? So in this passage, this is a very important observation because it's telling us how do we 
how are we motivated to forgive? How are we motivated to walk in love? Well, if we look to our example, we should forgive just as God forgave us. We should walk in love just as Christ loved us and showed that love by giving himself up for us. All right. So in this case, the comparison is given as an example for us to pursue and to follow. Other passages, you might see a comparison of, um, you know, two particular people or something like that being described. But in this case, it's the comparison is the example of God that we are to, to follow. All right. Any questions on this? Comparisons? Pastor, is it wrong if I say that in this whole passage, in the second passage, it says that therefore be imitators of God. Can the imitators of God as uh, compared to give himself for us? That means he died for us, therefore we should die to self? Oh, well, I think, um, yeah, that's a good question. He gives, he says, therefore, be imitators of God and notice that coordinating conjunction and walk in love. So he's giving us two commands. Um, and then he gives the comparison. So he's not saying for us, uh, he's basically saying for us to, to walk in love, um, that we are imitators of God and walk in love. And the comparison is he gave himself up for us. So there is that idea, right? That what did Jesus say? Greater love has no one than this, than he who lays his life down for his friend. So certainly one aspect of walking in love could be to give of ourselves for someone else. I don't know. If, is that what you're asking or were you asking? Yeah, that, that, yeah that's it. Pastor, because I see that... Um, to me, it, like, it relates because of uh, that we are supposed to be imitators of God, that uh, we are to walk in love just as Christ has loved us. So therefore, if you are going to be imitators of God, as he gave his life up, that we should uh, die to self and, and imitate what he has done. Yes, that would be really the ultimate example of love, right? To, to make that sacrifice for others. Jesus walked before us and did it. To show us the example. All right, good, good observation. Okay, so comparisons, that's something else to, to look for. Another, and I just have a few left here, so um, is look for any lists in a passage. Identify uh, any lists that you see in a text, and I've got one example here from Ephesians chapter 5. And again, list is just simply, do you see any, if there's any time where there's more than two items mentioned together, uh, identify that list. So, uh, Pastor Dwayne, I'm going to ask if you could read this text and then um, identify any lists that you see in the passage. Okay, but immortality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints and there must be no filthiness and slave talk or coarse jesting but we are not which are not fitting but rather giving of thanks for this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Okay, lists. Um, well, you've got immor Im immorality, immorality, uh, immorality and impurity or greed. There you got three. Yep, good. So there's and one list. Yeah, and then we have another and verse four, filthiness, silly talk, and coarse jesting are not fitting. Silly talk and coarse jesting. I don't know what coarse jesting is, but it must be a silly talk also. 
and then uh, then the fifth one is no immoral or impure or covetous or idolater there you have what two three four immoral impure covetous oh and then that's all defined as idolatry yes all right so that's it good so there's three lists here now again we don't just identify the list we want to think about okay what's the connection so notice let's look at the first list he groups immorality impurity and then greed together now that's kind of interesting i could see how immorality and impurity are connected right both speaking of likely uh you know sexual sin but then he says greed normally we associate greed with this idea of of for money or for wealth possessions we don't associate it often with sexual immorality so that's an interesting connection i'll come back to that uh, notice the second list filthiness silly talk coarse jesting again those are all connected together with this idea of 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 uh, filthy or evil talk all right so they're linked together and then finally the third list immoral there's that an impure he already used that but he uses it again immoral impure and then he says covetous man now again covetous is similar to greed right it's it's wanting more uh of what you don't have wanting it from something else now how does that connect it to immoral and impure Again, those we have an idea more of this idea of a sexual sin. So by seeing these lists here, I think what, what we can note here or identify is Paul is giving us some insight into sexual sin here. That it is of the same um, category or same motivation as greed that sexual immorality and greed are of the same class so to speak that is greed is is wanting more of what i don't have that's at the heart of sexual sin covetous coveting wanting something that god has not given again he connects that idea with immoral and impure Okay, an immoral person is someone who has a covetous heart. He's discontent. Now, seeing these three, these three lists in this passage together, I think that because the first list speaks of, you know, sexual sin, the third list speaks of sexual sin again, immor- immoral and impure. I think the second list in verse 4 is of the same... Um, idea or category that 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 this is that verse four is speaking of our speech that is sexual or immoral in nature all right so i think each of these three lists are connected together because paul brings them up all in the same you know just in these three verses and it all has to do with really i think sexual immorality Um, and that the other thing we can see from these lists is that sexual immorality is directly connected to a greedy or covetous heart. Now, and by that, I don't mean greed for money. I mean, greed greed just means, to covet means, I want something I haven't been given. And sexual immorality and purity is rooted in that same motivation. I want something that I haven't been given. And the reason that this is important to, to note here is notice verse 4. He, he directs attention towards immoral speech. There must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting. Those all have the idea of foul language, uh, sexually immoral language, dirty jokes. And then notice he says, don't have filthiness, silly talk, or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather... Here's a contrast, 
but rather giving of thanks. Now, how does how does giving of thanks relate to uh, immoral speech? How is it a contrast? Think about this for a minute, guys. How how is giving of thanks a contrast to immoral speech? Paul saying, the opposite of. Uh, go ahead, Paul. The opposite of co uh, coveting is to be contented. So, so giving thanks. Is... Yeah, to be content, and at the heart of contentment is is a, a thankful or grateful heart right i should say this at the root you guys see that what is the solution or how would you counsel someone struggling with sexual sin paul gives some very important insight here is it's not just telling them, okay, don't do this and don't do that and don't look at this and don't be around these people. Certainly that will help. But really, if you want to, to solve this issue of sexual impurity, you need to deal with the heart of discontentment. And so, yeah, Paul tells us here, look, don't tell dirty jokes. You should be using your speech to express a content heart by giving thanks. That's the connection. And just like you said, Paul, the opposite of covening is to be content. Right? A covetous heart is not content. They say, I want more. I want more. I want more. Even if I have to sin to get it. But a content heart says, God has given me all that, that I need. So I should be thankful and not pursue these sexual sins. You guys see the connection? Any questions on that? This is just by paying attention to the lists here. We can see this insight from Paul. This passage was really actually very helpful to me personally as I saw that connection between contentment or discontentment and uh, immorality and realized, you know, my problem is I'm discontent. And that's what needs to be addressed in my heart. When the, when I cultivate a heart of contentment, being satisfied with what God has given, um, not just in the area of money and possessions, but also in the area of sex, in, in the area of uh, purity, um, then a content heart will not seek for more than what God has given. Any comments or questions on that? Yeah, I just find it interesting that a lot of lists in the Bible usually ends with a word that catches everything else. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if that's a pattern for every list, but even the Ten Commandments, the final commandment is to thou shall not covet, right? And, and yeah, that just catches every, everything, right? And uh, because everything comes from a covetous heart, uh, whether it's coveting God's glory to, at a very high level to coveting uh, pleasures for ourselves uh, in terms of sex or money or, or anything else to, to even coveting like uh, physical kind of low level things like this wanting to satisfy, you know, physical desires, right? So, but the covetousness just covers everything. So, uh. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, sometimes you'll see at the end of lists. Sometimes you'll see at the beginning of lists. For example, in 1 Timothy 3 in Titus, the, the elder is described as a man above reproach. And that's the first quality he mentions on the list then the rest of the list really is a description of the man who's above reproach. Um, but yeah, in this case, in Ephesians 5, and even in the Ten Commandments, yeah, there's sort of that 
that key summary one at the end of the list. All right, so good observation. And any other thoughts or comments about this? Okay, so <clears throat> this can be, again, this isn't just busy work that we're doing here. We're trying to think of, we're not just looking for a list just to, you know, check that off from the assignment, but actually we're looking for, okay, how does this list, what's the connection between these things? Maybe I should even put that here, identify a list, and what are the connections between the items in the list. That's really what we're trying to understand here. How are these linked together? Uh, what is the connection between them? All right. Okay, good. All right, just a couple of more here and then uh, I'll let you go. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. So after you've looked at the verbs, the pronouns, the conjunctions, um, the contrast, the comparisons, the, the list, the, I can't remember if I got everything, then look for cause and effect within the passage. That is, is there something mentioned within the text that is a connection or a cause and effect between that and something else within the passage? So we have, for example, here another passage. I've chosen these passages all from Ephesians. Um, there is a connection here, uh, cause and effect in this particular passage. Uh, let's see. Uh, Tanjin, can I have you read this one for us? Ephesians 5, 13 to 16. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For, for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. Okay. So do you think, see anything in here that describes how something is done or connects one thing as a result of something else? And, uh, the first step change all things become visible and then uh, for everything that becomes visible is light. It's correct. <laughs> yeah, notice, yeah, that word when here. Um, all things become visible when they are exposed to the light. So that's a cause and effect, right? When something's exposed to the light, it becomes visible. Cause, the cause is uh, when something is exposed to the light. Okay, the effect, I should do it this way. The effect is all things become visible. Okay, so that's the idea. When something's exposed to the light, it becomes visible. That's the cause and effect. All right. There's another one in verse uh, 15 describing how something is done. Be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. Uh, I think it connects. Verse 16, making the most of your time. Okay, yeah. How you walk, you walk by 
making the most of your time. Okay. So the cause would be how you walk. And he says that, and then the effect that's describing how you walk. All right. So how you walk, that's the key link there. All right. So it's just looking for a connection of something that causes something else. There's a there's something that's said that is the cause that is the cause of something else in the sentence, or describing how something is done. All right, so you can look for the word how, by the way, that will be a clue at times. Okay, got to get through these last few. All right. All right, Pastor Tim, what about the last part of that verse 16, because the days are evil? Isn't because like, uh, I guess, a, a, a cause as well? Or... Yeah, maybe a motivation there. I could see that. Um, Verse 16, <laughs> yeah, verse 16, um, uh, the cause, the days are evil, kind of the effect or sort of the motivation we could say is make the most of your time. So I, I could see that. It's more in this case, though, more of the, like a motivation. All right. Uh, purpose result. This one is similar to cause effect, um, but this is more the idea of a, a purpose, a, a why. Cause effect is more of a how. Uh, purpose result is more describing a why. Why? Um, I should do it or what it results in. All right. And so the example I chose for this one, and I'll just do it for you guys, is Ephesians 5, 6 to 8. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. That word for tells us the purpose to obey this command is because God judges immorality, right? Let no one deceive you. Why? For because of these things, God's wrath comes upon the sons of disobedience. So that, and then there's the because, God's wrath comes because of these things. So there's really two purpose results in here. All right. Uh, and then verse seven. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. That's a, a reason, a purpose. Don't be partakers. Why? Because God's wrath comes upon those who are uh, the Im immoral people. That's verses 3 to 5. And then he says, verse 8, 4, you were formerly darkness. Don't be partakers. Why? Because you were formerly darkness. You used to be immoral. But you're not that way anymore. Now you are light. So the four here in verse eight identifies a reason or purpose. Don't be partakers. Why? Because you were formerly darkness. And now you are light. And then walk is again, therefore, is the implied idea. Walk as children of light. Because you are light in the Lord, now walk as children of light. That's a, that's a result. Okay, so, so in verse 7, or verse 6, 4 and verse 6 describes the purpose to obey the command, um, let no one deceive you, all right? And then he gives the reason for that is because God punishes immoral people, all right? And then he says, be, the next one, because is the idea of uh, God, God judges uh, the immoral because of these things. The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. All right. So here, look for words like when you're doing the purpose and result, look for words like for, uh, because, so that, in order that, 
all of these tell us the, the why, the, the purpose, or a result of something. In order that, sorry. Sometimes so. Okay, look for those words. Purpose result statements. Okay. In addition to that, look for any conditional clauses. That is, you, if you see the word if, so for example, in Colossians 2, if you have died with Christ, um, why, if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as, so he's saying, why do you do these things if you've died with Christ? Or verse 1 of chapter 3. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. So if you've been raised up with Christ is the condition. All right. And again, it's introduced by that word if. So look for those as well as you go through a particular passage. Do you see any conditional clauses? And one thing too to notice. Yeah, Tanjin, go ahead. Uh, yeah, verse 20 and verse, uh, verse 1 of 3, chapter 3. And you, if you have been raised, something like that, is it more uh, correct? Like uh, since, if we use since, because I've, for my understanding, if if we use the word if conditional like something cannot or do not or something like that depend on conditional so but uh since you have been is it uh, <laughs> is... yeah um there is a class of uh conditional clauses in greek called that uh sometimes you can translate it as since that there's not, it's not a possible condition. It's actually true. Uh, it's actually a true statement. So in this case, you, you are correct. You could translate it since you have been raised up with Christ. Uh, in this particular example, that would be true. Um, so... And then, yeah, in verse 20, uh, since you have died with Christ, that would, that would also work here as well. There are some cases where in Greek, the idea is not, is not necessarily if, but since, that it's all, it has taken place, all right? So that's something to consider as well. But look for these, these conditional clauses, and yeah, in some cases, it actually is making a statement. Now notice here, he says, and normally in a conditional clause, you see if, in English, you'll see if then. Uh, if I am hungry, then I will eat lunch. Okay? Notice the if then. The action is I will eat, but that action is dependent on if I am hungry. It's the condition. Now, often you will see though, in the translations, it will say, if I am hungry, I will eat. You won't always see the word then in these conditional clauses. It's implied. So, for example, therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, he doesn't say, then keep seeking the things above. There's no then there. But the idea, it's implied, if then. All right? Or in this case, since. Since you've been raised up with Christ, then keep seeking the things above. All right? But there's the then is not there, but we understand it to be implied because it's a, a conditional statement. Okay, so sometimes you'll see if then, but sometimes you won't see the word then, but it's still a conditional statement. So look for those in your text. 
And as Tanjin pointed out, sometimes it can mean since, that it's not a, a doubt that's been raised, but it is actually a statement. Since this has happened, therefore keep seeking the things above. And only the context will tell you if that is the case. He's speaking here to believers. Uh, so uh, they have been raised up with Christ. They have died with Christ. So he's speaking to believers and he's telling them, since this has already happened to you, why are you doing these things? Since you've been raised up with Christ, then keep seeking the things above. So the context tells us that the sense would be a, an appropriate translation here. Does that answer your question, Tanjin? Or? Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. So good. Good observation. We cannot always substitute if for since. We have to see from the context if that is acceptable or allowed. Okay, uh, I won't cover these in detail, they'll be in your notes, but two other things to look for, look for figures of speech within the passage, um, those can be helpful, again, figure of speech means that it's, the actual words are not meant to be literal, but they refer to something else, so for example, in Ephesians 5, he says, you are light in the Lord. Now, he's not saying that they are physical light, like a light bulb or a, a, an object emanating light, but they are light in the sense of being pure, being, uh, being holy. And so he's using light here as a figure of speech. It's a description or darkness, right? Verse 11, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. Well, it, it's not literal darkness he's speaking of, but he's describing the sinful behavior as darkness. In contrast to light being a pure and holy, okay? Or in verse 14, awake sleeper and arise from the dead. Well, when someone's dead, they're not asleep, they're dead. Uh, so sleeper here is is a, a metaphor. It's it's not literal. He's not speaking to someone who's literally asleep, but he's spiritually asleep. Is the idea okay? So look for those figures of speech, words that are not meant to be literal, but are uh, referring to something else. And then last but not least. <laughs> is the last thing to look for is just look at the tone of the passage. Um, and you do this uh, early on a little bit. We talk about tone, but it's helpful to identify as you look at the your passage, what is the tone of the author there? And so I have one example from uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Okay, so these are the I've identified 12 things to look for specifically after you've completed the diagram, go back through the passage and look for these specific things. And as you do that, it will help give you more and more insight into what the author is saying in the passage. Okay, it's, it's a guided observation where I'm directing you to look for certain things because these are things that as you study and look for them, I, you will gain more insight and understanding of the passage just by looking for these particular things, okay? So I will give in your notes, we don't have time to do it uh, this evening, um, um, an example from Philemon, all right? We diagrammed that uh, several weeks ago. And so I, I'll give you an example. Here's the diagram. And then in the notes, I will just give you um, the, uh, an example of textual observations and what to do for that. Because you will have an assignment. One of your assignments is to make textual observations of your assigned passage from Colossians. And so I'll give you an example from Philemon that you can look at 
and see what this step looks like. Okay. All right. Well, again, uh, we covered a lot here. Um, next week, uh, Lord willing, we will take a look at the next step, which is the word studies. All right. And that that's one that I think many of us are familiar with. We've done before. And I'll just show you the approach that that I take when I do word studies on a particular passage. All right. So we're going from um, the broad understanding of the book. Then we focus our attention on the passage and we first look at the phrases and clauses within the passage. And then we narrow our focus to do textual observations of the passage. And then we'll narrow our focus even more in the next step by looking for and studying particular words within the passage. Okay? So that's where we're headed um, for, for next week. Um, that'll be our focus, okay? I can tell you guys are uh, ready for bed. <laughs> but uh, any any last questions, uh, comments before we depart for the evening? Tanjin, let us know how your uh, um, your vacation in Ephesus goes there. Tell us what things you discovered. <laughs> uh, a lot of uh, things. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Min, for for attending tonight. And um, as I said, just uh, try to keep up on your assignments. I know that those will help you as you practice doing these things. Um, and anytime you have a question, one of the one of you brothers sent me a, a diagram this week and asked for my input. So that was great. You know, always want to, if you have any questions on an assignment or you have any passage you're interested in or want to talk about, or um, please, uh, I would love to to give you some feedback if that would help. All right. Well, let's. Uh, Continue to pray for Brother Joshua, who's still out of the country and uh, doing, he's studying for his doctor ministry classes. So we'll keep praying for him and pray for uh, Paul's father in law, Mr. High, and also for Van, just for his health as well. Um, Pastor Dwayne, could you, could you close us in prayer this evening?